Hey, this is Annie. And Samantha. And welcome to Stuff Mom Never Told You, production of iHeartRadio. So, Samantha, as you know, we are in my favorite season yes. of scary things. Although the world is terrifying right now, but <laughs> you know, you can find a haven in horror movies, or at least I can. Um, Your hope is that you can. I'm hoping. Uh, and for today's question, I wanted to ask you, have you ever played a scary video game? No. Never. Have you ever been scared playing a video game that wasn't scary? No. <laughs> <laughs> You've never had an epic battle of Mario Kart and felt just fear in your heart Not that you might all. be embarrassed? <laughs> Not at all. Uh, because I already have very low expectations, and then I give a disclaimer to everyone that I'm playing with. Mm-hmm. about how bad I am at video games and or how I could care less about most of these video games. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, it took the pandemic for me to actually start enjoying these things. Yeah. As you know. So, because I just never cared. Uh, of course, my partner is really big into the video games. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he loves, like, The Witcher and Zelda, all of that. So, to mm-hmm. me, that's not necessarily scary. I know you talked about your scary video games. And I yeah. finally watched you guys play a couple of them. Yeah. <laughs> but my over-anticipation about how things are going to go bad is so mm-hmm. high that I, you know, I have to have warnings or I'm going to walk out because I just don't care. Yeah. I don't, I don't want to know. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, no, I don't typically play it like that. I don't play those games because um, I don't quite understand them either, I think. Mm. I just want like storyline wise or mechanic wise, all of those things. I'm like, so what's the <laughs> point of having a story if you're trying to play a game, but inevitably you're just playing into their story, which has already been written out? So I've asked because you know I asked you three times. I was like, wait, what? What is this? Wait, why? Mm-hmm. I think a lot of the question is why. But for like, yeah, for me, like what I enjoy is silly games that we get to punch each other in the face mm-hmm. and see who wins. Yeah, in the story. So- yeah. Very two-dimensional characters, too, typically. Uh-huh. Yeah. Well, we clearly have, like, the very opposite taste because the story, to me, is the most important thing. Right. The, the most important thing. And actually, we're going to talk about uh, one game that really messed with, I guess, the video me- game mechanics you're talking about where the story's already written. There's one game we're going to talk about in here where they mess with that, and it's wonderful. <laughs> um, yeah, I love, 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 love scary video games. You did get to see me play uh, virtual reality, the VR version of Five Nights at Freddy's, and that was I may have to post up. I may have to, because I took a video, (laughs) and it's not even the best video, because the best video is when you actually jump and fall backwards into, onto a chair. chair. Um, But yeah, I definitely took a video of you playing in which you just start screaming. Uh, (laughs) And by the way, it would be an NSFW, because there's a lot of cursing. Yeah. It was terrible. It was, well, I put the headset on for like a second, looked around, and yeah. I was like, nope, and I took it right back off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is true. This is true. And that wasn't even the game. No. It was just at like the opening screen. <laughs> well, like I turned around, I was like, there's a thing trying to come up behind me. Those are mm-hmm. animatronic things, which you know I already have a little fear yeah, of, yeah, that they're going to come to life. And in this video game, they come to life, and I was like, oh, hell yeah. no. Now mm-hmm. I'm good. Yeah, no, it's, that was fair. Uh, <laughs> I highly recommend it, both the non-VR uh, and VR versions for anybody who's interested, because it was terrifying. Yes. And they're funny, yes. also. Um, so today we're talking about women and girls in the survival horror genre of video games, which is one of my very favorite genres. Um, and I'm actually, I'm going to put a disclaimer here that I'm going to be very selfish in this one, because oh. it is one of my favorite genres. And I'm going to talk about the ones I have personal experience with. So I know a lot of you will probably get angry at some things that are not on this list. Uh, Always write in. I'm happy to play another survival horror video game. Um, And we do have a list of honorable mentions that I know people are going to be like, well, you didn't talk about this clear example. (laughs) But yeah, I'm going to be a little, little selfish. Um, And I also want to put in another disclaimer. Anyone who's played these games will know a lot of them come from very sprawling video game franchises with storylines that are really tough to wrangle. Like, I actually love this thought exercise of trying to explain some of these games because they're so weird 
Uh, they've been retconned. Resident Evil slash Biohazard is the one that has come to mind. Also, Silent Hill. Oh, gosh. Um, where they're just complicated. And I'm again, I'm going to kind of stick to what I know about them and the research I've done on them. But um, Resident Evil, for example, you can have one iteration of a female character that's pretty well-rounded. And then another game, she's like almost completely different and wearing heels. And so, so just to put that out there. Also, also want to put in here uh, a lot of disclaimers already uh, that not every game or character I mentioned is great uh, when it comes to representation and feminism. And I do think it's okay to enjoy something that isn't actively causing harm, but always be mindful of those messages in the entertainment that you consume. So just, just putting that out there as well. And a uh, quick trigger warning, because we are talking about the horror genre, um, we are going to briefly discuss some violence against women and sexual assault issues. So put that out there. Right. And my contribution was very small, as you could have already told, <laughs> as you could already tell when we were discussing yeah. whether or not I play these games. Yeah. Uh, I know that there are movie versions of these games, a lot of them. Oh, yeah. And I'm curious when we get to some of them, if you've seen them and what your thoughts were. To be fair, I don't think I've seen them. <laughs> oh, that's... Not because no, because <laughs> I, I probably should watch like at least Silent Hill because that is seemingly up my alley. But I feel like mm. the only things I've seen available are the sequels, and Mm-mm. that is something I will not do. Is I will not see a sequel over the original, which you and yeah. I have had discussions of. Like, I'm, I'm appalled by some of your viewing, uh, yeah, oh, experiences. Yeah, she- Yep, Samantha is very angry at me right now. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so kind of that's the problem, and I, I probably should go back to it, but because also I don't have a big love for these games. So I will put that as like, I don't know what the hell I'm talking about, but I will join the discussion as much as I can. So as you know, we've talked a lot about how women love horror. I love horror, just not video yeah. gaming, so it's kind of one or the other um, for me. But I'm, I'm getting mm-hmm. into it, y'all. I am getting into it. And yet, <laughs> you know that... There has been a traditional lack of representation of women in the genre, and apparently in video games at large. So yeah. I do see a lot of them in that you tell me about them, I feel like. So therefore, I, yeah. I notice those more than I do anything else. And I probably know more about those games, I feel like, mm-hmm. than others. So that's I feel like I'm a one-up in that tradition. <laughs> uh, but go. of course, and I did get to witness this, it gets even worse when it comes to women of color and queer women, which seems to be a new focus when it's not just queer baiting to see them as right. actually thoughtful characters. Right. And for anyone who's listening and is like, like Samantha, oh, I've never played these video games. I won't be able to relate to this conversation. Uh, if you, you'll recognize these tropes. Like they're not even in just horror. So. Um, never fear. Uh, <laughs> it is all inclusive. <laughs> yes, we, we try our best to make our video game nerdery episodes inclusive. Um, so, when women do show up in these games, they are almost always one of two characters in survival horror. Uh, if they're a playable protagonist, meaning you, a person, plays them, um, they're strong, smart, capable, although often provocatively dressed and not dressed for the situation uh, that they're in. Or, if they're not that, they're the damsel in distress that serves to, f- to lead the male character's story and also probably provocatively dressed. <laughs> um, a plot and set piece to up the tension and nothing more. Uh, male protagonists and non-playable characters are almost always capable and also very rarely provocatively dressed. <laughs> I'm always um, I'm always shocked by how somehow during the apocalyptic moments women end yeah. up being able to have the perfectly cut uh belly shirts. Oh yeah, that was one of my favorite things about um there's an interview Mila Jovovich, I think that's how you say her name. Mm-hmm. Um she's in Resident Evil, right. which is based on the games um and there was one movie where people were like, don't you think it's odd? An, an interviewer was asking her that you're wearing kind of this like tube top and short shorts. And she said, well, we wrote in a heat wave to explain it. And that just cracked me up <laughs> so much. <laughs> and it was actually freezing. They were filming in winter and they oh, had to CGI no. their breath out. But they wanted an excuse for them to be provocative. Oh, no. Like it's not, there's not a problem in women dressing that way. 
But no, it's just absolutely like, not. Obviously, this is for the male gaze. Like, this is not yeah. about yeah. women being comfortable. This is literally, right. well, she is a superhero. We can't just have her being in a t shirt and jeans. We need yeah. to have her in this ridiculously form fitting leather, somehow metal, somehow chain mm-hmm. bikini type of thing with yeah. a pistol on her mm-hmm. thigh strap. Because, you know, yep. who and doesn't I think that? in one of them, I think in one of them, it's already been the apocalypse. And she's wearing fishnet stockings and wandering I mean, the desert. Who doesn't? You know, all? I won't. If you're in the apocalypse, maybe you want to feel good sometimes. I understand. You got to feel good. <laughs> and, and fishnet hoes if while that fighting for zombies? You. Come on. Yeah, I've, come on. Um, okay. Uh, we're getting off track already. Um, often these male characters act as protectors for the female protagonist when there is one. So even if you're playing a strong, capable female character, there's usually a male character that's still stepping in to protect you. And also, I I do use the term strong female character a lot in this. When I say that, what I really mean is a well-written character that isn't dependent on men to rescue her. But I know there's been a lot of back and forth on that whole kind of phrase. Mm -hmm. And what what do we really mean when we say it? Um, So... Put that out there, too. Let's start, since we've already mentioned it a couple times, with Resident Evil. So, Resident Evil, if I had to explain it very shortly, is basically uh, capitalism gone really wrong, led to zombie apocalypse. Always. Uh, And that's, yeah, that's it. (laughs) 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 The Umbrella Corporation invented this T-virus, and it got out. And made all of these zombies and all of these creatures. Um, so the, the first game, which I've only played once, and it is extremely difficult. I was going to ask, have you played this game? So the first you played once, okay. I've played Resident Evil one through five, oh, and a, a bunch of the like uh, side, like Code Veronica and all that stuff. Have you seen so, all yeah. the movies? Yes, I have, okay, and I've then. seen them all in theaters. <laughs> Die hard. Yeah. Well, and it's really funny, too, because as I was researching this, and I'm like, feminism, Resident Evil, and a lot of people haven't played the games, but they've seen the movies, and there were a lot of essays about, like, you know, these movies aren't great, but we're always saying, like, why can men have mediocre movies, and it's fine, but we're not holding up, like, well, see, these movies make a lot of money, and most of the characters in them are women, like, most of the lead characters. Mm Mm-hmm. So, I mean, there is that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, There mm -hmm. is that. There is also interesting dressing, but there is in the games as well. Mm -hmm. So, in the first game, uh, which came out in 1996, uh, she is a member of STARS, which is this elite fighting force, kind of like SWAT. Um, Wait, did you mention who she is? Jill Valentine, yes. Okay. Jill Valentine. Yeah, uh, sorry. (laughs) Um, So, she is what is considered one of the first uh, playable female characters in survival horror. If you find a list of best characters, women in survival horror, she's on there. I guarantee she'll be on there. Um, And she, I mean, in the first game, she uh, definitely, she was dressed in like police gear. Um, I most associate her with the third game though. Um, which is where she fights Nemesis, which is this huge, like, hulking zombie. He's terrifying, terrifying. Um, And she fights him multiple times. He is not to be trafficked with. He terrified me. Like, I would just hear that music cue, and I'm like, ah, no! (laughs) (laughs) Run, 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 run! Um, But, yeah, she was a... She was a very strong... Like, she had her plans, and she was going to make it happen. She was going to fight Nemesis. She was going to take him down. She even, like steals his rocket launcher, that's an option, and shoots him with it. But yeah, she was wearing a um, mini skirt and a tube top. And I really can't think of a less functional outfit during a zombie apocalypse than a tube top. I just, you're going to constantly be oh, readjusting. Oh, you're doing that just standing. So I can't I imagine running. Right. And she... Does she wears a sweater tied around her waist, which always cracks me up. Maybe there was a heat wave. Um, but when you are like just standing still in the game as her, she like pivots her hips, like kind of sways her hips and she puts her hand. Yeah. 
And it's okay. like, look at me, look at my body here. It's so Which good. Which is probably completely out of proportion and it's not plausible in real life. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, breast animators, they exist. Mm. Um, so there, that's Jill. She's also in uh, the movies... Um, and she wears the same outfit in the movies. It's very oh. iconic. I'll say that. Like uh, every time I see it, I'm, oh yeah, Jill Valentine. There it is. Yeah. Uh, Claire Redfield is another character from Resident Evil. She first appears in Resident Evil 2. Um, she goes into the zombie infested raccoon city searching for her brother. She doesn't have any training, but she's determined. She goes on to lead the activist organization Terra Save. Um, I loved Claire. So the Resident Evil 2 is set up where you play the story as one Leon, male character, and then you play it on her side. Uh, and they kind of intersect in that way. And Claire, I read a lot of interesting... <laughs> I love that these articles exist, but I read interesting articles about how it's almost a commentary on male stalking. in Because there's this character, Tyrant, who's just, again, this huge zombie, and he's just following her around and, like, harassing her, trying to kill her. But that was interesting to me, that take of she's having to deal with that, whereas Leon isn't. Uh, and just this hulking thing, following her, always this threat in the back of your mind. So that's interesting. Um, yes. You also have Ada Wong, who uh, is a spy assassin... Of course. But she she wears a sweetheart dress and pumps. What are sweetheart dresses? So those are like plunging neckline, but it kind of like it goes down and then comes in. Okay. Almost like a diamond. I'm making a lot of gestures that she, the listeners there's can't a, see. There's so much gestures, like just downward <laughs> pointing with the, her whole hands. <laughs> yeah. Like I'm painting a, quite the picture. You are. I'm going to have to go look it words. up. <laughs> like sweetheart dresses. I don't even know if I know what that is, but okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and then there's Ashley Graham. She's from Resident Evil 4. She's the president's daughter. And the whole game is based on you, like, rescuing her. She has this plaid skirt, the sleeveless top, and a sweater tied around her neck. I don't know why the sweater tied around. Is it supposed to, like, be a prep here. school type of thing? Yeah, 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 yeah. You can frequently see up her skirt, and she is underage. Oh, uh, nice. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and she is very damsel in distress. She is often getting carried away by other men slash zombies, screaming, uh, and you have to rescue her. Like, it's... Because in every fight you get in, that there's the potential for that to happen. Yeah. So eventually, for me as a player, ah, I'm so annoyed by her. I was so <laughs> annoyed. Like, can you just not... Get kidnapped. Um, yeah. So it's Which like... Is Princess Toadstool, Princess Peach, except for it's a PG-13 version. Oh, yeah. Uh, and, like, it's a bad... She's not a great feminist depiction because she is... Her voice is pretty shrill, and she's like, ah, 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 and it happens all the time. To all the time. And all the time. She, she, I, maybe I just wasn't very good at that game. Uh, <laughs> she really doesn't have any agency. There's like one scene you play as her, but that's the scene when you keep seeing up her skirt. Oh, no. Uh -oh. Yeah, because she crawls through things, but you're, the camera angles from behind, so. Uh, okay, then. Yeah, 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 yeah. So those are the ones I think of when I think of Resident Evil. I know there's a bunch more, like Rebecca, that we could talk about, but then this podcast would never end. So we're, we're going to move on. <laughs> Um, to Parasite Eve, which I'm so excited to talk about. So this was a 1998 game about the mitochondrial Eve, which is a concept that I love. Mm -hmm. um, so the villain who can make you spontaneously combust or she can mutate you into a monster by um, activating something in your mitochondria, uh, Eve. And then you have the protagonist, Aya, who is immune uh, Aya is a 25-year-old New York City cop who wears job-appropriate clothes. <laughs> what? And that was truly a rarity at its time. Yeah. Very much. But from what I understand, because I've only played the first one, two and three really reversed and sexualized the whole the female protagonist. And from the images, I, I just did a quick search. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. She's like, there's a shower scene. Yeah, if you can get attacked and like get your clothes ripped off and it's, they stay ripped off. Um, I read a really interesting article about how 
Gamergate bros like to point out that us dreaded social justice warriors ruin their games. But what about when they're ruining, they're ruining right. the games? That is not, I don't need to see all that. I just want to see her turn people into monsters. I don't know. <laughs> Can't I at least have that? <laughs> um, Aya isn't a tomboy, and she really could have been. She's capable, but she's pretty, she's sensitive. She frequently is thinking about the loss of her sister, but never in a way that holds her back. Uh, and then there's Eve, uh, the game's villain. She she is both the Madonna and the whore. Uh, she's sexualized, but she's like often monstrous. So at both at the same time, and your brain is like, oh my God, what is happening? Um, and then she... Oh, gosh. She, instead of destroying, she wants to create. And that is an act of destruction, the way she's trying to do it. But that's an interesting aspect of that as well. And when you think about, like, the miracle of life, it gets turned into something horrific when you learn she's pregnant. You're like, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So those games, uh, I actually never beat that game either because it was the really difficult, like, just play, playing-wise. And I got to this crab. I still remember I got to the stupid crab in the sewer and I couldn't kill him. I didn't have enough ammo and I kept dying. And I think to this day, I have that game. I bet if I tried to load it right now, I'd be at that damn crab. <laughs> Interesting concept. A crab. It's my, my Moby Dick, uh, the crab from the Parasite crab. Eve. Mm. I don't think it was even a boss battle. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Jeez. All right. So, uh, Bioshock. I also wanted to talk about Bioshock, which is one of my favorite games ever. It's the one when I said, there's a game that messes with video game mechanics. It's this one. Oh, yeah. um, they like to troll people, don't they? Yeah, 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 As yeah. We're, yeah, we're going to talk about that a little bit. But, um, so as I got to thinking about this game, and there's a lot of debate about the feminism of this game. Um, so this is set in kind of a alternate reality world that's underground called Rapture, where people have, things have gone horribly awry. And people are addicted to this substance called Adam. And yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll talk about that in a second. But to get Adam from dead bodies, you need a little sister who has an injector and she can pull it out of their bodies. And these little sisters, which are creepy little children, um, are protected by big daddies who are like these huge scuba diving things that you do not want to mess with. They will kill you. <laughs> um, so if you think about that aspect of the game, if you look at the little sister, big daddy thing, I've been thinking about this a lot because it's, it's basically a commentary on how young girls are the most innocent because the player, you as the player have to make the moral choice of whether to kill them or not because you need Adam too. Right. But... You don't need to kill them. You could, it will just be harder. The game will be harder for you if you don't. Mm -hmm. And for this choice, the developers chose a little girl. That's like that's the moral. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So that's really interesting. I hadn't really considered it before. I will say I'm a, I'm a big softie. I could never kill one. I could never have killed a little sister. Oh. <laughs> but you'll kill all the dogs. Oh, wait. No. <laughs> yeah. That's another story. <laughs> Yeah, coming up. Um, <laughs> and then just the the dynamic of, which we are going to talk about because it does appear in these games, these survival horror games a lot, of the big daddy protecting the little sister, um, basically like a grown man protecting a little girl, uh, and that inherent power dynamic. And of course, there's also a commentary on capitalism in this game and patriarchy on how you can get ahead by draining these little girls. Like you, you can... Stay, use this system to make you stronger. Um, even they resist and they like beg you to stop. Um, and the only thing that can stop you is a big, the big daddy is a big man. Big daddy. Yeah. Do not mess with the big daddies. Um, so in the second Bioshock, some of the little sisters become big sisters, which is the big daddy equivalent. Um, so quote here, Big sisters are the new gatekeepers of rapture. Born from little sisters, they don costumes much like their former protectors, the Big Daddy. However, these lithe, broken, mysterious creatures are worlds different from the hulking beast that inspired their design. And everything from the way their armor appeared to how they cocked their head had to tell the story of their creation. So, 
due to the trauma of their past, they are quite aggressive. They are erratic. You do not want to mess with them either. Um, they protect little sisters, but they also uh, are kind of like vengeance, trying to take any, they'll kill anybody who killed a little sister. Mm. Um, and yeah, yeah, yeah. There is just the fact that this substance is called Adam. And then there's another substance for your health. It's called Eve. Uh, has given me a lot to think on as well. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then if we look at Bioshock Infinite, you have Elizabeth, who is the damsel in distress of the game. You're trying to, their whole point of the game is you need to get her, rescue her, and deliver her to someone else. Um, she does have powers. She can tear holes through space and time. Uh, she's helpful, but most of what she does is in service to the male player character, Booker's storyline. Um, there's a lot of caged bird imagery in this game. There's a running theme of, is the caged bird really free? So even when you rescue Elizabeth from her tower, is she really free? Um, it's a thought experiment throughout the game. Like, they actually kind of ask you, <laughs> what mm-hmm. do you think? Um, and yeah, she is pretty much at the whims of her father. And I suppose, spoiler alert for any of these games, <laughs> I should have said that at the Maybe top. Maybe we need to put that at the top. <laughs> no, no, no. I don't think we've talked about one that's um, recent yet. But okay. for this one, spoiler alert, Bioshock <laughs> yeah. Infinite. Uh, she does kill her father. It's very confusing. Um, and this game also has a storyline about racism that has a much debated... Uh, it's been the source of much debate. Uh, basically, the world that this one takes place in is in a still sort of pre-Civil War times. And there's an underground railroad equivalent. Uh, and the game starts with the player winning a contest to throw a ball at an interracial couple, which I think was a white dude and a black lady. Um you can't, in this society, you can't be an interracial couple. couple. Um, and it's a choice you can make to throw the ball at them and blend in or uh, throw at their captors. Um, so, yeah, this is, you can find people arguing that this is very anti-feminist games, all of them, or that they are feminist games. Lots of, lots of discourse about yeah. it. Um it does have one of my favorite fuck you endings, which I will say is when the developers are like, you got basically a lot of gamer gamer bros complained about one aspect of the ending of the first one. And in this one, they were like, oh, really? <laughs> we will make it so much worse. I love it. Um, there are an assortment of powerful women in these games. There's Tenenbaum that, that like really built these worlds. But you only interact with them through documents and pictures. Um, so yeah, yeah, there is a lot of ongoing conversation about this. <laughs> Ooh, you've gone through a lot. Like I'm sitting I here have. listening. I'm like, okay, okay, because I don't think I know much about Bioshock in general. Uh, mm-hmm. I just know it has something to do with something yeah. wrong with your DNA or mixing up, you know, yeah, 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 yeah. whatever atoms and such. <laughs> uh, I didn't know it was called Adam and Eve, which I thought was funny. But yeah. I know, I know you got some more and I know you got a real oh, doozy yes, coming up. Uh, <laughs> but first, we do have a quick break for a word from our sponsor. back. Thank you, sponsor. And I'm going to do the thing that Samantha hates the most. And I'm going to start with the sequel here. <laughs> I don't hate it the most, but it is a pet peeve. I do not like watching the sequel without seeing the first. I feel like that just, you have to go in a little timeline. Apparently, watching Carrie 2 and never seeing Carrie is a great sin it in is. Samantha's book. I cannot uh, But it will be rectified. <laughs> I cannot believe this. Uh, so we're talking about Silent Hill, which is one of my very favorites games ever. And specifically, we're going to start with the second one because it's probably the scariest game I've ever played. It's one of my favorite games ever. Um, So, good golly, if I had to try to explain the plot of Silent Hill. Oh, Lord. Um, Basically, there's this town that was once a tourist town, but then there was a cult and they summoned a demon and now people go there to get punished for the sins. Uh, It's like purgatory. Um... And we'll talk more about the origin because it does have a young girl uh, at the heart of it. But uh, there are a lot of abortion. There's a lot of abortion imagery, pregnancy imagery, sexual assault imagery, 
monstrous masculinity, um, religious iconography. Um, like you find like a lot of statues of Madonna, the praying woman. So, uh, Silent Hill 2, I found so much interesting writing on it, saying that, um, first off, this game is very much a judgment of the player, more so than most games I've ever played. And depending on how you play the game, that's going to determine what ending you get. And they vary wildly. So, it's really asking you, like, who are you? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Oh, it's messed up. Um, Maybe that's why I don't like these games. I don't want to (laughs) know. Yeah, I'm curious what the first ending I ever got was and what it... Because now I've played it enough, I've gotten every ending because I just want to see the ending. Mm -hmm. But um, many people in the writings I found have claimed that this game is a commentary on toxic masculinity. So let's break that down. James is the character that you play. Um, And you... James arrives to Silent Hill... um, after receiving this letter from his wife who died three years earlier, we're told because of a terminal illness. However, when you get to the very end of the game, um, it is revealed uh, he killed her recently, uh, smothered her with a pillow because basically he couldn't take it anymore. Uh, She sometimes says she wanted to die. You do get flashbacks throughout the game, uh, but she also said she didn't. Um, He killed her because he hated her. Uh, and he was sexually frustrated after years of being unable to have sex with her. And he does, he feels guilt over this. And that's why he's in Silent Hill. He's being punished. He's in this purgatory town. Um, and I should also mention this purgatory is of your own making. It's st- from stuff of your, your mind. Um, so, throughout, your, as you're playing, all of the monsters, almost all of the monsters, are feminine, sexualized, or children. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. But there's one that looms above all of the other ones, and he's known as Pyramid Head. <laughs> um, <laughs> Pyramid, right. and he has a huge Pyramid Head, yeah. uh, as you might imagine. He's not called that in the game, but that's just what fans call him. Um, and he's like this huge hulking thing with, uh, carries this enormous, it's called a great knife that's as big as him. It makes this horrible scratching sound all along as he's coming for you. Um, but in these articles, a lot of people argued that Pyramid Head res- represents hypermasculinity. What James thinks is a, a, what a man should be. Um, you know, he doesn't have any emotion. Uh, he's strong and he's got this huge phallic object that he carries around. Um, and he terrorizes James. He fetishizes him. He objectifies him. Um, at one point later in the game, you can pick up the great knife. You can take it. But if you do, it slows you down. Um, it, it's like a big hindrance. Like even when you're not ca- like about to use it, it slows you down. Um, it is extremely powerful, but you're better off without it. Uh, it not only represents, yeah, a penis, but the weight of James's guilt. Um, <laughs> That's uh, maybe not, but that's how I interpret it. Uh, Pyramid Head can also choke James and lick him. Um, He chases James. He forces him to run, renders him helpless. Like, it's interesting. I've never thought about it, but he's not a hero. You're not playing a hero in this game. Mm -hmm. Uh, You're playing a killer, someone who murdered his wife and feels guilty about it and runs away a lot, Um, which is not your traditional, like, male protagonist that you do, you see in these games. and James has to come to the realization that he doesn't need Pyramid Head, he doesn't need this hypermasculinity to reject him and to move on. If you want to get the good ending of the game, you have to do this. Oh. Yeah. Um, meanwhile, there is Maria, who, depending on your choices, uh, she can get treated very, very differently. She looks exactly like James's wife. She sounds exactly like James's wife. Um, and the game is almost daring you to judge her for being the same woman leading a different life because it's implied she's a sex worker. I don't mm. think she is. Well, she's not real, but, right. you know, it's implied right. that she is. Um, she dies a lot. She dies multiple times because she follows you around um, as a way to torment the lead male character and demonstrate his failure when it came to protecting his own wife, even though he's the one that killed her. Right. Um, she is a very, like, male gaze 
understanding of what femininity is. Again, this is James's mind. Um, so she's sexy, she's flirty, she's dependent on a man for help. But James thinks he wanted his wife to be that. But, uh, I mean, she even says, I can be whatever you want me to be. Uh, he soon grows annoyed by her and tries to abandon her multiple times. Um, she exists as this reminder of his failure. And you also have to reject her. Um, to move on and get the good ending of the game. You have to reject, he has to reject this false idea of what he thinks women should be and what he thinks men should be. Um, although you can get an ending where you stay with her, uh, where you stay with this false version of your wife. Um, defeating her is the final hurdle you have to achieve to make peace with his wife. Um, and what happened between them and he moves on and he adopts a little girl <laughs> named Laura. Um, so if you look at the monsters again, they're largely objectified women or diseased women. Uh, you shrill wife Mary, like she has this really shrill scream she does in a hospital bed. She's a boss fight too, implying he also has to reject the toxic idea of a shrill nagging wife. Um, then you have an abused woman named Angela with imagery around her assault. And she says to James, who tries to save her with violence at one point, um, you think you can save me. Will you love me? Take care of me? Heal all my pain? Hmm, that's what I thought. And then she leaves him. Um, so just this idea, he thought he had to take on, like save her, be her protector. And she was like, no, <laughs> you really don't. Um, so it was interesting, the, the reading about this. And um, some people wrote that they, it was how everyone was a victim of toxic masculinity here, even James. Um, the only way to escape Silent Hill is to reject that and show some compassion. Interesting. See? Is this See the how movie? these games? That's Sean Bean? Is he, is he the oh, main guy? Yeah. Okay. The movie is interesting. I will say, I have a friend who just watched it. She's like, what the hell? <laughs> so, because it's been popping up on my, like, you should watch yeah. this. But I think it was the second one that it was advertising. Mm. And it looks like, is it the dude, is it a uh, Jon Snow guy in there too? I don't know. I've only seen the first one. I will tell you it's not good. It does okay. have a lot of interesting messages in it. Well, as you can probably tell from listening to right, talk about it. <laughs> right. I'm trying to remember, because I realized I also confused this, don't judge me, with The Hills Have Eyes. Oh, oh. There's, there's some overlap, unfortunately. Is um, it? Okay. Maybe yeah, I'm not I mean, it's, out of it's gross. It's gross. Yeah. Uh, I saw it in high school and uh, never seen it again since. Oh. But okay. I will tell you, Sean Bean spends uh, most of the movie looking confused. And all, almost all of the main characters are women. So there's also feminist critiques of this. Okay. Uh, yeah, of the movie. Hmm. Um, but okay, let's step back. Yes, Sorry, yes, Samantha. Yes. We'll go to the first one. All right, let's go. So <laughs> just briefly, because I feel like I have the most to say about the second one. But So in the first one, you get drawn to this town, uh, Silent Hill, and you meet Alessa. And Alessa is this young girl who has supernatural abilities. Um, she's been tortured. She's been tormented. She's been burned. Uh, she was used for this kind of ritual sacrifice that created this purgatory Silent Hill thing. Um, her nightmares in the first one are the source for Silent Hill. Uh, and her trying to escape kind of starts the whole game. So it is female trauma turned into merciless vengeance. Because in the first one, you, don't, you didn't necessarily do anything wrong that you know of. Mm -hmm. But she doesn't, she can't differentiate between that and who deserves to be punished. Um, then there's Lisa, the perhaps overly sexualized nurse, but does have one of my favorite death scenes of all time. <laughs> and Sybil, a very competent police officer who is, I guess she does get kind of damseled in the end, um, but she, she's throughout the game very helpful um, because, yes, you are playing as a male character in this one. However... In the third one, you play as Heather Mason, who is the daughter of the uh, person you played in the first one. Uh, she's the adopted daughter. Uh, she's also the reincarnation of Alessa and Cheryl. Don't worry if you don't know, you don't understand that because it's confusing and I'm not going to take the time to unpack it. <laughs> um, she does, uh, so Heather does wear a miniskirt, but she's not really sexualized. She feels much more practical. 
Um, and that actually plays on her fears later because this one has a lot of abortion and like fear of pregnancy. Uh, like it's the whole thing. Because mm-hmm. she's sort of like can give birth to Satan, essentially. And this cult is trying to make that happen. Um, she does start out in a shopping mall. Like, she's a kid in a shopping mall. So it doesn't feel so like, oh, why is Jill Valentine in a tube top during the zombie apocalypse? <laughs> um, she, I read a lot of people who said she's almost a direct commentary on the schoolgirl character of the time who were usually kind of creepily sexualized. Mm-hmm. Um, she uh, becomes the target of a cult, loses her father, then has to kick some serious ass along the way. But again, there's that father-daughter relationship that just comes up so much in these. Well, like when you were mentioning of that, the fact that, because you kind of quickly moved off from the second one, talking about how you adopted a daughter. But that seems to be a trope with a lot of these as a rectifying or... Uh, yeah, like a, a redemptive... Her- redeeming a, yeah. a very bad character by saying, see, look, I take care of a little girl. Not just yes. like I'm a protector, but it makes me a better person and therefore you have more mm-hmm. sympathy for me. Right, and it's like that innocence. Apparently, the little girl is the most innocent thing. I don't know. I just had never really put together until I was making this list. Like, wow, this is well, everywhere. I mean, then, now that you say that, because some of my favorite Korean films has that same arc way as well. Like they're rescuing a little girl who is, he is the father figure and he sacrifices yeah. himself for her. But he's done mm-hmm. so many bad things that this is his redeeming quality. And so therefore, yeah. all his past is forgiven because of this. Exactly. Exactly. Oh, and we're about to talk about that a lot. Yes. But, um... First, to wrap up, Heather, she does give birth to God. Uh, it was a monster. Okay. I like that was just flippantly said. She does yeah. give birth to God. It, honestly, <laughs> in these uh, realm, this game, it's kind of, yeah, like, oh, yeah, she gave birth to God, um, who is a monster that she kills. Um, right, yeah, I could really unpack a lot more on that one, too, but uh, no time. Um, I did want to wrap up with Silent Hill 4. So I played through 5, um, but in Silent Hill 4, you do have this character called Eileen, Silent Hill 4 is actually a hilarious game to think about during quarantine because the plot of that game is that you can't get out of your apartment. You can't escape your apartment and you're being tormented by these, like, nightmares. Oh. Um, but you do have, like, a little peephole and you can spy on Eileen. That's great. Um, and she is dressed for a party. There's absolutely no real reason for her to be dressed like that. And it's just, like, short, tight mini dress. Um, and you do... She does follow you around. You do have to protect her. She gets, like, bruised if you if she takes hits. Um, and you do get to play her for a while. But it just feels so, like, I don't know why she's in this dress and in heels and she's slowing me down. And the fact that you're, as a player, getting annoyed at this kind of female depiction, I do think is really problematic. <laughs> um, and you do see that quite a bit. And it's weird, too, because it puts you in the position, like, I am a woman but I'm playing this dude and it's most of the developers are probably dudes and I'm getting annoyed by this female character. So it's like almost like getting a peek in their mind or something. Yeah. Like this is how you view women. Or, yeah. I don't know. I mean, that could be said for many uh, male directors who do really ridiculous tropes for women of how they see women. You're like, really? Mm-hmm. Have you ever really been around a woman? Yeah. No? Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so... Uh, We do have one of my favorites coming up. But first, we're going to pause for one more quick break for a word from our sponsor. And we're back. Thank you, sponsor. And yes, we're back. With The Last of Us and The Last of Us Part 2. So, yes, I would say spoilers. If you're trying to not be spoiled by these, I would stop here. It's not, we're not going to get too into it, but still, I think you can, uh, you could probably deduce what's, what happens in these games based on what we're going to say. So, I'll put that out there. Um, so, people know I love these games. It's pretty much a zombie apocalypse where in the first one you play as Joel, who is, yes, this like, male protagonist who's done terrible things uh, to survive. And you, your job in the game is to protect Ellie, who is a 14-year-old girl who is immune to the zombie virus. And you're, you're trying to deliver her to the Firefly so they can get a vaccine. Um, so I love Ellie. Ellie is one of my favorite characters of all time. Uh, and I remember the first time I played that game, she was such a breath of fresh air. I, I was one of those things where I'm like, I didn't know I was missing this, but here it is. Right. Um, 
she really subverts your expectation of young girls. I mean, we've been talking about how they represent innocence throughout this, and she still does, but she is like not the demure. <laughs> she curses. She's feisty. She's got really dirty humor. She can fight. She's scrappy. Um, you do start out protecting her, and Joel won't let her have a weapon, even though she's proven like, no, I can, I can use one. I can protect myself. Uh, and eventually, yeah, he, he's like, nope, okay, I'm going to give you this weapon. She really carries her weight. And eventually you do spend a decent section of the game playing her to protect the lead male character. Um, and it's still, you know, furthering his storyline, the whole thing is. But, oh gosh, and that's my favorite part is when you play as her. It's much scarier to mm-hmm. me, but um, she is immune. So she, I love how she uses that to her advantage. Like, oh, I love it. She is queer. Um, she does survive an attempted rape and deals with the trauma of that. I'm glad they put that in there because most games don't. Like, you kind of just move on. Right. But she was clearly despondent after that and changed. Right. Well, not um, only that, but she also killed a man. Yeah. And that Violently. traumatized her too. Like, and yeah. then I'm like, oh, good. I'm not just moving on. They did put, a, like, a lot. I did witness this, y'all, obviously. Yeah, she did. <laughs> um, but they did put a lot of, like, depth of character in that. Yeah, this is the reality is a young girl who wants to be a good person is traumatized because mm-hmm. she had to survive and this is what she had to do. But the reality is you would have some kind of trauma to you. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and and it's great that you... I mean, it's great and sad. It's one of the things that makes the second one so effective because then you see all of the trauma, what that what she's grown up into, and you just feel so sad, especially because you spent the first one protecting her. Um, so in this game, you also have Tess, who's Joel's partner in crime. She's the one that convinces him that maybe a cure is possible and he should take... He should care enough about it to complete their journey uh, after she dies because she gets bitten so she knows she's going to die and deliver Ellie to the Fireflies. And this game also has Marlene, who is the leader of the Fireflies. Uh, And it does start off with the death of Joel's daughter, Sarah. Um, And yeah, that propels kind of his like cold, violent, distant nature. Um, And you do spend a lot of time protecting Ellie uh, and... Joel's violence, which is traditionally a very masculine coded thing, is how you survive. More on that in a second. But let's talk about the second one for a minute. Yes. Um, and these are things that at least I can attest to because I've witnessed it, not necessarily yeah. because I played it. And we uh-huh. ended up having a big, like a deep dive about how you and I interpreted it. And it was so different in a diff- mm-hmm. like all the different ways. So it was interesting to see your uh, love and attachments and my detachments and why that Mm -hmm. existed. So I will say Mm -hmm. it had a very deep meaning behind your understanding of these games. Yes. In the sequel, y'all, there was a marathoning of this game, just for (laughs) that out there. Um, So Ellie is the primary playable protagonist uh, that you do spend a decent amount of time playing another female character. Um, And I know we're going to go into that a little deeper. Mm-hmm. And Ellie is still a badass and awkward and funny, but now you really see her loss of innocence living in this world. You also have a lot of like references to past events, but you don't exactly know what happened. So flashbacks yes, are a flashbacks, big component yep. to this game. And seeing that and her really going all in on this masculine violence revenge thing is a direct contrast to her struggle with forgiveness when it comes to Joel, which... Is a very painful. Is very painful as a player. I did know that the constant yeah. commentary I did have. She was like, "Oh no, and my heart, <laughs> my heart." And that was a lot of screaming. At one point, yeah. though, we had to make an agreement for me to be a present in these game playing. Is that you have to give me spoiler alerts because yeah. I cannot handle bad trauma. Like I just yeah. Today I like this day and no, age right now. This year I was like it's too much. So you have yeah. to give me a heads up. You don't have yeah. to tell me exactly what, but heads up is what I need. Um, mm-hmm. So that happened a lot. So yeah, it was very painful to see, especially because you yeah. do get connected to them as like, you're these people. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, and there there were times when I was like playing it and I was like, please, 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 no. Please, Ellie, no. Please don't do this. Uh, and she loses pretty much everything in one way or another in pursuit of revenge. Okay. Which brings us to Abby. Abby, Abby, Abby. Oh, uh, as my friend likes to say, Abby and Ellie are the same side of the coin. <laughs> and zombies are on the other side. I even got a coin made for her because oh, she perfect. went into this whole thing about it. Um, so Abby is also propelled by revenge of her father. Uh, and she chose 
this chance at revenge time and time again over a chance at happiness, as did Ellie uh, with her ultimate journey ending when she realizes it's pointless. Ellie realizes it's pointless, so does Abby eventually, that it doesn't solve anything. We're not going to feel better. Um, And Abby's determination for revenge condemns all of her friends to death. Uh, Not that they didn't want it to or that they weren't involved, but she was the leader and they might have let it go and she could not let it go. And the thing is, Ellie was innocent at the start of this, but was hurt in the fallout. And Abby's quest for vengeance perpetuated a cycle of vengeance because Ellie later goes on to threaten an innocent person, just as Abby did in her determination to get revenge. So you see that cycle of vengeance playing out, and you see it on a bigger scale with a war between the Washington Liberation Front, the WLL for Wolves, and the Seraphite, which is a religious group. So, you know, a bunch of factions of people trying to survive in this apocalypse zombie world. And they're warring, and it's just so pointless. It's just so pointless. Um, you also have Dina, Ellie's girlfriend. You do not mess with Dina. Uh, she <laughs> does get sidelined by pregnancy. Uh, but up until that point, she is a huge asset. And even after, with her help, um, deciphering and collecting information, her pregnancy, along with the influence of a younger character, is what ultimately stops Abby from her quest for vengeance, even after Ellie killed Abby's pregnant friend. Um, oh, you're putting a lot of spoilers up in here. Yeah, I know. I tried really hard to avoid it, but I can't. I can't. Um, And Dina fights for her family. We get to see their little slice of domesticity, her, Ellie, and their son, even if only for a little bit. So painful. Why? My heart. (laughs) She did scream my heart quite often. Yes. Um, And I kind of just looked over. I was like, okay, we may need to pause, but she couldn't pause. Not yeah, any, any yeah, cannot yeah. pause. No. I will say, I feel like Dina may have been the innocence character in this for Ellie as well. Yeah. Because uh, yeah, Ellie yeah, yeah. tries to protect her in that same manner. Um, mm-hmm. But not only her, uh, the character Jesse, who I was really upset. Honestly, that one upset me more than any of the others, I think. Um, but Jesse also comes in as a protective and a friend and an ally because of Dina. To me. Yeah. Um, and you do have other fleshed out characters there, like Yara, um, who I only got to see briefly because I was like, I'm I'm out. This is too much. Um, <laughs> painful. <laughs> it was. I was like, and then there's Nora, Mel, and Maria. And there's a lot of that within like the sprinkle of outside characters that come in. Yeah. And you're like, who are they? Remind me again. Um, yeah. Also, dogs. Yeah. Sorry. She uh, all the dogs, y'all. <laughs> I do want to point out as you're going through that list, I realize like Maria's. A lot of the leaders in this game are women of the peaceful places. But the leader of like the WLF is Isaac, who's a man. So that's interesting. Um, okay. And I did want to touch on really quickly. I know I've mentioned it before. There was this huge backlash against this game. Um, and it's specifically Abby. Um, so a lot of these games are games where the protagonist is... Uh, usually pulled into or propelled by a white dude. Like, even if you're playing a female character, you got into it because of a white dude. Uh, and they're usually games about male violence. So both of these vengeance stories and sort of father-daughter forgiveness arcs. Um, and I was thinking about this. It, people were so ready to forgive Joel from the first one, the man who you played from the first one, for his actions. Um, because he was protecting a young girl, like you said. Um, but they were so ready to condemn Ellie and especially Abby, <laughs> um, which I maintain, if you'd started the game playing from Abby's perspective, this would be a different conversation. And that makes sense. But also, think about that um, before you judge her so harshly. <laughs> uh, yeah, I just had never really realized. Um, and then this the whole father-daughter relationship thing and the apocalypse made me think that men, again, are really afraid. They, they don't know how to handle young girls. Um, and it is interesting how often it comes up as, yeah, the little girl is the ultimate innocent that must be protected. So, all right, I could talk about those games forever, but it's it's going long. So those are the ones I wanted to focus on. I did have a couple honorable mentions here. You've got Alma Wade, uh, the psychic villain from F-E-A-R, Fear. Uh, Miku from Fatal Frame, everyone brings her up. Uh, She's searching for a brother fighting vengeful spirits. You've got Regina from Dino Crisis, which I played as a kid, and she had pink hair, and I thought it was the coolest thing. Um, Susan Ashworth from The Cat Lady. Well, okay, I got to talk about this very briefly, but you really, it really plays on the Cat Lady trope. Uh, her only companions are cats. Uh, lots of the villains in the game, which are called parasites, 
are, they feel like a commentary on violence against women. One male doctor kills his female patients and uses them to make art. Oh. Another eats women. It plays on the damsel in distress trope, uh, ramifications of stalkers. Sounds like an interesting game. I've never played it, but after huh. I was reading the description, I was like, I am into this. So the name <laughs> of the game is The Cat Lady. The Cat Lady, <laughs> yeah. Maybe that's part of the problem. I'm just going to put that out there, but huh, it, interesting. It's an indie game. It's a small game, okay. but I'm interested. Um, you have Amanda Ripley from Alien Isolation, who is Ridley's daughter from the Alien movie franchise, which I have played and is terrifying. That's the one that can hear you. Oh, yeah. Uh, the we talked about being, you. yeah. Yeah. Um, Alyssa from Clock Tower 3, uh, who is this girl's kind of like Buffy the Vampire Slayer. She's destined to fight these evil entities. That game is pretty scary. Um, and then the game Amy, which is a game with two female protagonists where every enemy is a man. Now, also, I found some games, very disturbing games, written by male developers that are all about kind of a- enacting violent fantasies on women that are in the survival horror thing. Mm-hmm. We're not really going to talk about that today, but I am aware that that exists. Um, and just some tropes to close this out. I've noticed, like, these games do have a lot of depiction of trauma. I was even curious, like, it's hard to think of a female character in these games that doesn't have trauma, and what does that like, is that because of the genre? Or, I don't know. That's a conversation for another day, perhaps. Is it a driver? Like, like it, it, yeah, you have to like, have a motivation. Does it have to be, though? Like, I'm yeah. curious. Um, depiction of sexual assault comes up on these. Depiction of mental illness, which can be very problematic in these games and in horror in general. Um, like Alice, Madness Returns, uh, which is a game where she thinks she's in Wonderland and kills. She thinks she's seeing monsters, but uh, they're not. <laughs> well, I oh, guess wow. they are. It, it's a lot. We could interpret that as well. Clothing choice is obviously a problem in these. Um, so, oh, that's been that's been a real whirlwind this episode. Yeah, it's a lot longer than we thought. I know. I'm sorry. I just I got going. <laughs> yeah. I just got going. I could keep going forever, but obviously, we must eventually stop talking about survival horror. Uh, but if I did miss any any games that you think I should play or that you think we should come back and talk about, even among the ones I've included, if you'd like something more in-depth, people are probably like, what? <laughs> but you can send those suggestions to our email, which is stuffmediamomstuff at iheartmedia.com. You can also send them on Instagram at stuffmomnevertoldyou or on Twitter at momstuffpodcast. Thanks as always to our super producer, Andrew Howard. Thank you. And thanks to you for listening. Stuff I've Never Told You is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. Listener.